should you bother getting an ADHD diagnosis in later life? If you've managed all the way through your life without a diagnosis, do you really need one? Can you just choose to decide that you're going to self-identify as somebody with ADHD? That's what I'm going to be discussing on this episode of the Generation Exceptional Podcast. I'm Bev Thurigood. Hi, you are very, very welcome. Now, I was diagnosed with ADHD at the ripe old age of 56 in January 2023. And if I look back now and try and decide, did I need to get that diagnosis? I have very mixed feelings about it. Now, I'm just going to caveat here that I'm not suggesting that what I'm thinking is right or wrong because we are all very, very different and we'll all have very different reasons for whether we choose to or choose to not go through the process of having an assessment and getting a formal diagnosis. So there's no right or wrong here and there's absolutely no judgment around whether you should or you shouldn't. It's very much a personal choice. But I'm going to go through the, I guess, the reasons, the rationale behind why I chose to get a diagnosis, especially bearing in mind that I chose to get a private diagnosis and it wasn't cheap. And I'm going to share with you the reasons why I did that. And also whether I'd do the same again with hindsight, which is a wonderful thing nearly two years later. So let me start with just a little bit of background, I guess, just in case you're new here. So I had a lot of struggles with menopause. When I hit my sort of 50s, early 50s, and perimenopause kicked in with a vengeance, it kicked in for me big style. And I didn't know at the time that I had ADHD. And I think both of those colliding together was just like a, a, a tinderbox going off. And it, I also left a full-time career to start my own business. So it was a lot of change and a lot of stuff going on. And I really struggled with certain aspects of setting up a business not the stuff that many people struggle with. I struggled with just the basic structure and getting stuff done. And it was almost like without any structure in place, I didn't have the ability to create that structure easily. I wouldn't say I couldn't do it, but it was hard. And it still is. I still find that quite a difficult thing to do to stay organized, to put things in place, to streamline the business, any kind of forward planning or um, strategizing in my own business. Weirdly, I can look at somebody else's and I can see what needs to be done. It's the most bizarre thing. But doing it for myself, I found very difficult. And it was during the, the sort of the four or five years after starting my business that the cracks started to really, really show. And a friend of mine picked up on the fact that maybe I might have ADHD. She is a neurodiversity specialist. Uh, she was a friend and also a client. And we talked about the struggles that I was having. And of course, she is a neurodiversity specialist, but she's not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So she couldn't diagnose me but I think she's seen enough people in her time who have ADHD for her to have a pretty good idea that the the behaviors, the traits, the challenges that I was um, showing were pretty aligned to how the DSM-5 describes inattentive ADHD and to an extent more the combined because I definitely do have some of the impulsive um, hyperactive elements in me, not necessarily physical hyperactivity, but definitely the brain stuff. And I did a TED 
TEDx talk uh, before I was diagnosed about the fact that there was very little research had been done into uh, women with ADHD as they hit menopause and how the hormones all get disrupted and there's a lot going on. And it was after I'd done the TED talk, which now has over 90,000 views on YouTube that I suddenly thought, ooh, if I'm talking about this and people were commenting on the video and I was getting people diving into my inbox and into my DMs asking me questions about this. And I suddenly thought, I haven't even had a formal diagnosis. I'm just making an assumption based on pretty extensive research that I'd done that I have ADHD. So for me, getting a diagnosis was more than just validation for me personally. It was also... Um, in, in my mind, I felt that if I was putting myself on a public platform talking about something, I probably needed to have at least the diagnosis to confirm that I had some credibility around what I was talking about. So it was a validation issue for me, but it was also a credibility issue. And I have to say, when I had the assessment, one of the bits that are one of the things that scared me most about having the assessment was finding out that I didn't have ADHD because if that was the case, I'd done a TEDx talk that was getting views and I had no credibility to be talking about this. And it was really worrying. And of course, there was also the fact that if it came back that I didn't have ADHD, then I had no explanation other than I must be very lazy, very disorganized, um, and probably not very clever if I can't do the basics. So I, I'm fairly certain from people I've spoken to that we all have these reservations when we go for a diagnosis, this fear that if they say we haven't, then what else is there? What can it be? So I chose to um, have a diagnosis or an assessment. I didn't choose the diagnosis. I chose to have the assessment. And it's interesting. I think we, we sometimes use those two words interchangeably. You don't go for a diagnosis. You go for an assessment. And the assessment dictates whether or not there is a diagnosis of ADHD. So I was going for an assessment. And I think it's, it, it's a relevant distinction to make because I think people always often say oh people are diagnosed too too readily it's too easy to get a diagnosis it is really not easy to get a diagnosis um the assessment process is is thorough and it's it's emotional and it's draining and it's also incredibly reassuring <laughs> when you when you go through it and you get the diagnosis that you've suspected so I chose to go privately. Uh, the reason being I was 56 at the time. And in the UK, if you go through the National Health Service, from what I'd heard, it was likely to take two, three, maybe even more years to just get seen. And I didn't feel I wanted to be waiting that long. So I made the decision to find a private um, ADHD clinic that could do my assessment. And I did some research, had another chat with my friend who'd initially highlighted that she thought I could be ADHD. And I decided to use uh, ADHD 360, which is a, a UK ADHD organization that does assessments and can then help with um, titration for medication and they offer coaching support and that sort of thing. Um, and I'd looked at a few, and for some reason, I can't really even tell you why, that was the one that I felt um, fitted best for me. I think, although I can't remember exactly, I think the cost was somewhere around, I think it was around £600, but I think that's because I had support as well. I think if I just had the assessment, it was a bit cheaper, but if I'm honest, that was one thing that I did find a little bit difficult with ADHD 360 is that I didn't find the 
um, literature or their website particularly clear. So I did go into it a little bit confused. I may have paid more than I should have done. Um, but I think it was around about £600. But that included, I think it was a year of support, including all of the titration and uh, follow-ups for medication, because I wasn't sure if I'd want to go down the medication route. And I think you had a three-month window. I, I'm, please don't hold me to account on this. Um, I may not have got this exactly right, but I think I had three months to decide whether I wanted to try medication. So I had the assessment on um, the 13th of January, 2023, Friday the 13th. And, and then I was going away on holiday for a couple of weeks. So I got the diagnosis. It was incredibly emotional. I can remember after the diagnosis, just breaking down and having a really intense sob you know, like snotty sob, you know, those horrible, ugly type sobs. And I remember going through to the kitchen and my husband was there and I remember just crying on his shoulder. And I'm not even sure what I was crying about. I don't know if it was relief, anger. I don't know. I genuinely don't know what the emotions were, but they just flooded out of me. And as I say, then I, I kind of went on holiday and that was that was that. And I did decide to try medication. It didn't work for me, or at least the medications that I tried didn't work. I tried two. I tried Concerta and I also tried Alvance. Both of them left me feeling a bit flat. Um, they, I didn't notice any marked improvement in focus or anything like that. But I did feel as if they just kind of squashed squashed me down a bit I don't really know how to explain it it was like the 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 whole me got sort of trimmed around the edges and and all of the creative bits around the outside got taken off and I was just left with this sort of flat centerpiece of me um so I and also there was this horrendous crash around about four thirty five o'clock in the evening I would just have this energy crash, like somebody had pulled the plug on my um, energy source. And I would just be wiped out for about an hour and a half until the um, drugs had kind of left my system. And then I was wide awake, which wasn't ideal because I'm not the best of sleepers anyway. So all in all, medication didn't really work for me. I know it works well for, for many people. It didn't work well for me. And of course, if you do want to try medication, you do have to have had a formal diagnosis, a positive diagnosis. Uh, they won't just give you stimulant medication if you haven't had that sort of uh, formal diagnosis. So I guess that brings me right round to the whole purpose of this podcast episode, which is would I do the same again, knowing what I know now? And I think the answer is yes, I would. I would have the assessment because what I think the diagnosis did for me more than anything was allowed me to feel completely at ease with having the label ADHD. And I know lots of people don't like the idea of having labels, but let's be honest, we have labels for everything through our life. We have labels about our gender. We have labels about our race. We have labels about our, um, just everything, everything in life we have labels. So another label is neither here nor there. But for me, having the label ADHD meant that I could reconcile lots of things that I'd struggled and challenged, been challenged by all through my life. So it was a label I was happy to take. Um, I did have a lot of, I guess, doubts and conflicts in my own head about jumping on bandwagons. And I had to really think hard about Am I, you know, is this is this trendy? Is it just trendy to, to to say I've got ADHD? And then I think back to the emotional 
breakdown I had after I was given the formal diagnosis and I think, no, this is not about trends or bandwagons. This is about finally finding some way to understand my brain, to understand my behaviors, to understand more about me. Oh, sorry about the, uh, the emotions. So no, I realized it wasn't about being trendy or jumping on bandwagons. It was absolutely the, the right thing for me. And, and having that label is, is a validation and it is an explanation. And in some ways, I guess it is an excuse, but I wouldn't like to use it as an excuse to not do things But it's a way for me to excuse myself for many of the failings that I beat myself up for in the past. So, yes, I would. From that respect, I would definitely go through the diagnosis process again. But I don't think you need to have a formal diagnosis to be fairly confident that you know your own self diagnosis isn't going to be valid and in the UK we have something called access to work which is a government funded scheme to help people who are challenged in the workplace whether that's a physical disability uh, a mental um, or cognitive uh, disability And you don't even have to be formally diagnosed. You just have to be able to show that you have challenges and access to work provides funding to give support, to help um, with, with whatever it is you're challenged by. So in order to, and I'm going through that process at the minute. Sorry, let me just finish that bit before I move on. So I'm going through the access to work process now. And even that in itself has brought up a whole load of, um, mindset stuff that I need to work through because I've never asked for anything from anybody. And I think that is a trait of people with ADHD that we're not great at asking for help. It's just another layer of, well, there must be something wrong with me if I've got to ask for help. So I've never asked for help from the government. I've never asked for financial support with anything. Um, So this is a little bit of a challenge for me. And the best way I can kind of reconcile this in my mind is the fact that I'm not getting something um, more than other people. It, what it, what it's doing is it's that, that funding support or the support that I get with that funding will just help to bring me up onto a level playing field with neurotypical people. And once I kind of got my head around that, I felt much more comfortable about asking for that support. Um, So as I say, you don't need a formal diagnosis to be able to ask for that support. So self-identifying, I think in my head, is absolutely fine. I, I don't think you need to have that formal bit of paper unless you want to go down the medication route. And as I say, although it didn't work for me, it has helped many, many people. So I'm not um, anti-stimulant meds or anti-ADHD meds. I just don't think they were the right right thing for me. What I would say, though, is coaching and support help. Um, Because a support worker, that's what I'm asking for from Access to Work is some support worker help because I think with that extra little bit of help I'd I'd be able to achieve more (laughs) than I can at the minute because although I keep up it is exhausting absolutely exhausting so yeah I think I'm kind of going off piste a little bit here but that's really what I just wanted to to share in this in this podcast episode is that the the diagnosis or the assessment process is very much a personal choice and it's a lot of money or a lot of time 
depending on whether you choose to go down the national health route or if you want to pay for it privately. And for those listening from other countries, I don't even know what the route is. I don't know how easy it is for you to access uh, psychological support to be able to get the assessment um, through your medical insurance or however else it works. I think there's a, a growing recognition that we are able to self-identify. And unless you absolutely feel that you need that tick in the box, I don't, I don't think, I don't think you do. I don't think you do. I would say though, one of the other things that the diagnosis has done for me is it's made it easier to tell other people, especially if friends and family about what it is I have because I think it's difficult sometimes to articulate what the challenges are without just sounding I don't know a bit pathetic maybe whereas when you can say look I'm not going to be able to articulate this very well but I have challenges with whatever your challenges are, because I, I, you know, not all ADHD uh, manifests in the same way. It doesn't always show up the same for everybody. But having that formal diagnosis is kind of another layer of credibility when you're talking to friends and family to say, and, you know, when the, when I had my diagnosis, this is what they told me it means. So it's not just you making it up for those of you listening and not watching to this, I'm doing like one of those little rabbit quote marks because I don't think anybody makes this up. But I think there's often a perception from within us that when we tell other people about our ADHD, they think that we're making it up. Did you follow that? Okay. <laughs> so I think the, the formal diagnosis gives us that extra layer of credibility. But if you're able to articulate confidently what it is you're experiencing and you don't feel any need to be apologetic for it then you don't need that diagnosis you don't there's nothing I don't believe that there is anything wrong with self-identifying so there you go that's um that's it solo episode done today um let me know in the comments, if you are formally diagnosed or if you self-identify, I'm really interested. And if you want to share the rationale behind why you're choosing to have a diagnosis or not have a diagnosis, assessment, I should say, um, let me know in the comments as well. And I'm really excited because I've just started a brand new Facebook community called the Generation Exceptional Community for Gen X women. And we let a few late boomers in there as well, who may or may not be a little bit neurospicy, to come together as a community and just share our journey as we go into our next chapter. And it's it's not really got any massive focus other than I just think as older women need to come together and support each other and share stories and cheer each other on and that's what we've got in the community it's uh, it's less than a couple of weeks old um and we're heading towards the 100 members i would love to get it up to 100 so if you're interested i will put the link to the facebook group in the comments below and you are very welcome if you are a gen x or a late boomer woman with or without adhd we welcome you into the group. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me today and uh, I will talk to you again soon.